your, your critics would argue that many of those other causes for climate change that you've just mentioned uh, have been uh, analysed and rejected. Well, this is why the subtitle of Heaven and Earth is Global Warming, The Missing Science. There's a huge amount of science which is in the peer-reviewed refereed journals which has never been looked at by my critics. They only look at the atmosphere. So I've dealt with the whole lot. And if they cherry-pick and selectively take the atmosphere, then they get a story that's unrelated to the way the world works. Most of my critics are playing the man. They've never, ever discussed science with me. And as soon as someone plays the man, you know you've won the game. I'm speaking with uh, Professor Ian Plymer, whose uh, brand new book is terrific read. It's called Heaven and Earth, Global Warming, The Missing Science. There's a little picture of it for you. Now, um, you've actually been criticised for using the endorsements of politicians for books, given that you criticise, say, the IPCC for uh, being a politicised body. Um, how, how do you react to that sort of criticism? Well, I've had uh, endorsing on the back of Heaven and Earth. I've had Rushlaff Klaus, the President of the EU. He has written a book on this subject. He's certainly a politician. Uh, Nigel Lawson, a former politician. And he's written uh, an endorsement on the back. He's also written a book on climate change. I go into history a lot, and I've had Australia's foremost historian, uh, the economic historian, Professor Geoffrey Blaney. So I have certainly used people who have published work on this subject. I've done that very deliberately because there's not only a divide between city and country, a divide between people who have a big view of the world and a very narrow view of the world. There's also a political divide. And conservatives in the left and conservatives in the right share this view. So this has almost been picked up as a, uh, a new form of fundamentalist religion. In fact, you've pretty much described it as that in the book. I is it that rabid? Yes, in chapter 8 I go into a comparison between the hallmarks of fundamentalist religions and uh, deep green politics. And I once wrote a book on fundamentalist uh, religions. I'm moderately familiar with the way they operate. And uh, in this book I argue that the failure of European socialism, the failure of European Christian um, causes and the fact that a lot of people now are wealthy, they need something to believe in, they need something to hang, to hang on to. So this is filling and a void in our lives in many This is filling a spiritual way. void okay. and this is why there are many people who have no science, have grasped onto the fact that we must do something. They don't know what it is and they don't want it to hurt but we must do something. So I argue uh, from a spiritual basis in the last chapter, and I've had a number of my theologian friends look at it and give me the tick of approval. So, uh, some have even called for your trial and incarceration for, uh, for purporting these sort of views. It, you know that there's something going on when it gets to that stage, oh, surely. Oh, yes. Look, once they, once they call for my trial and incarceration, you know that they're not going to argue science and that they're rattled. And if I'm incarcerated, well, I'd happily have a life sentence with a lovely blonde. <laughs> Oh, where do you go from there? Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, you get a second life. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, what would you say to the argument that even if there is some slight chance of the worst case scenarios being thrown out there happening, is it worth trying to do something now to stop it? Is, and what sorts of things could we do? Or is your fundamental position, hey, this is a complete waste of time? Firstly, carbon dioxide is plant food. It's fabulous stuff. We pump hot carbon dioxide into glass houses to make horticultural businesses thrive. The second thing is we humans have lived in warm times, we've lived in cold times, we can adapt. The third thing is, from looking back in history, the great boom times economically were the current times, the medieval warming and the Roman warming. And we know that every time it's warm, we have booming economies. I hope I'm wrong. That means we'll have a warm, carbon dioxide-rich planet and economies will thrive. In saying that, though, are you not taking into account the fact that, say, sea level rise is likely to wipe out coastal communities around the place and uh, there's an, a, a deleterious economic impact there? Sea level rises and falls quite considerably. The biggest sea level rises and falls we have in the past are 1,500 metres. In this last glaciation, which has been going for 37 million years, we've had sea level go up and down by about 130 metres. 6,000 years ago, it was two metres higher than now. And not only do we have sea level go up and down, we have the land level go up and down. So here we have England. They've got a Scottish Prime Minister. There's a Scottish Parliament, independent from Westminster. And Scotland's rising, and as a result, Eastern England is sinking. So they've got the trifecta there. They've lost everything. <laughs> and this we know. We can measure land level going up and down and sea level going up and down, and what happens is we get migration. 
it's always happened, the next great sea level change will be a fall because we've probably got the maximum rise because in previous times when we've had sea level rise, we haven't melted the ice sheet because we've still got ancient ice there which we can measure. So we've not had those changes in the past and there's no reason why we should look at them in the future. One of the uh, scary predictions being made by some of the cli climate change scientists and they seem to be having an impact on politicians as well is that we're going to get hordes if not millions of uh, flooded refugees heading south to inhabit the north of Australia. You don't buy that argument obviously? <laughs> well I'm, I'm old enough to, to have seen those arguments dressed up in different ways in politics. This is scare tactics. Uh, uh, it's hype, it's ideology, unrelated to evidence. What I've got is a book of evidence. It's the missing science. It covers a great spectrum of science. We look at sea level in great detail in this book. I think it's the least we have to worry about. Should we do anything at all about CO2 emissions? CO2 emissions are in many ways tied into pollution. And in the Western countries, we certainly have been addressing pollution because pollution kills. And we don't want to be putting muck into our waterways and our airways and into our soils. So we've been addressing pollution. At the same time, we've been stopping the sulphur-rich gases coming into the atmosphere, but we've still been pumping carbon dioxide out into the atmosphere. So we can separate carbon dioxide and pollution. We are well down that track. In many growing economies, they still have to do that and that will happen. We know from England only 60 years ago the massive pea soup of fogs killed people. They now still pump out carbon dioxide but they don't have those filthy fogs. So we can do it as long as we're wealthy. Professor Ian Plymer, let me run some things by you. It was sort of a pop quiz here um, and I want you to tell me whether in your opinion they're rubbish or not. Quickly, inexorable global temperature rise caused by humans. Zero out of ten. Zero out of ten, okay. Stronger, more catastrophic cyclones and hurricanes? I think we'll have to keep you in after school so you can learn a bit more. Fantastic. More extreme weather events? I think you have to go back to the drawing board. Accelerated polar melting? I think you need to put ice blocks in your drinks. And glaciers receding? Uh, you need to understand the glaciers recede and advance. With that one, I'll give you five out of ten. Okay. What about the shutting down of the North Atlantic Ocean current? It's never shut down. The only way we'll shut it down is if we stop the Earth spinning. And if you can stop the Earth spinning, best of luck. Ocean acidification. The oceans have never been acid. They will only be acid when we run out of rocks. Species loss? We're always getting species loss. We're always getting species turnover. It's a normal phenomenon. Nothing to be worried about. Incidentally, I noticed that was happening pretty significantly before there was any real global push for uh, anthropogenic climate change. Well, quite, but you know, different badge, same bandwagon. <laughs> Tropical disease migration into temperate areas. Well, that's mainly a reference to malaria. Uh, malaria actually thrives in cold climate areas as well as tropical areas. Uh, so I noticed that's one thing your critics get stuck into you about. Why do, you do, why do they, they say you're fundamentally wrong when you say that? About malaria? Yeah. Well, I only use Paul Reiter, who is, is the world authority on malaria, and who quotes uh, Shakespeare and the egg and the, and the uh, incidence of malaria in Siberia and uh, Scandinavia. Malaria has been quite widespread in cold climates. You get rid of malaria when you have an annual average income of more than 3,100 US dollars. Malaria That's is a disease of poverty. And finally, Al Gore. Oh, I think you should go back to uh, Hollywood. That was a very short answer. Would you like to expand a little bit <laughs> well, on that? I mean, The uh, Inconvenient <laughs> Truth is one of the, the best-selling DVDs and what, what grossed lots of money for him. I mean, uh, is he completely wrong? What comes out of Hollywood? Hollywood fantasy comes out of it, so we give him a tick for that. Hollywood uh, fantasy to frighten your witless, we give him a tick for that. You get a good Hollywood blockbuster, you make a lot of money, he gets a tick for that. But... I hope you're not arguing that something that comes out of Hollywood is related to reality. Oh, no, I wouldn't know An that. inconvenient truth is a wonderful piece of entertainment, and then you go home and think, well, that was fantasy at its best. I've spoken to people who were genuinely frightened having watched that DVD. I can remember as a kid I was genuinely frightened by Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. wasn't true. Scary movie, for sure.